As U.S. and China rivalry intensifies, today we will look at how this is playing out on all fronts. From its opening up from zero COVID and refusing U.S. and other Western vaccines, the new diplomatic tug of war for allies in the Indo-Pacific, to the simmering chip-centered tech competition and a vital role Taiwan is and can continue to play. Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news and analysis from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Betty Chen. I'm Brath Wang. Joining us in the studio today is Lu Yezhong, National Zhengzhi University, Department of Diplomacy, Chair and Professor, and Stephen Tan, Managing Director of the International Policy Advisory Group, an expert in Taiwan's and the region's security. A warm welcome back to both on the show today. I also spoke earlier to Riley Walters, Deputy Director of the Japan Chair at the Hudson Institute, an expert on Japan and Taiwan ties with the United States, based in Washington, D.C. And I also spoke earlier to Alex Capri, research fellow at the Hinrich Foundation, who is also a World Economic Forum agenda contributor. Alex is an expert on supply chains, trade, and global governance. With China's reopening on January 8th, many countries are introducing entry restrictions on passengers from China. The European Union is asking 27 member states for extra screening, with Japan requiring a negative PCR test. The Chinese foreign ministry responded with a tit-for-tat attitude, saying it will reciprocate with the same measures. Our first question goes to you, Dr. Tan. How will this diplomatic showdown likely manifest with China's defying attitude, and what impact do you feel this will have on the global economy? Okay, well, first of all, I think um, uh, lots of people predicted uh, last year that the COVID-19 would never come to an end unless and until China seri seriously deals with it. And this is exactly what we're facing right now. Um, so China all of a sudden, you know, it has a 180 degree switch in policy from zero COVID policy to the one that decided to coexist with the COVID virus. Starting from December 7, all of a sudden, you know, all the, the open up the society, open up the borders in two ways. Number one, I think uh, uh, whether or China has whether China has prepared for it, uh, it that's a critical tr uh, issue because of lack of transparency. We don't know exactly what's going on other than you know the anecdotal um, you know videos, clips, news spread of words. No, we, we don't we don't know exactly. There's no official data formally incredibly released by the authorities. Uh, WHO and, and, and many other authorities in, in, the, in the global health management uh, era have repeatedly urged China to be more transparent. So as uh, the, the, the health experts around the world can, be, can use that data as a base to further assess uh, you know, the risks and the measures to, to tackle the, the, the world problems. Now, all of a sudden, you know, tourists and the visitors and the Chinese nationals go across the border to other countries. This has caused a lot of concerns uh, in many countries, including Taiwan. Um, you know, many countries, including us, have tightened up the border control, uh, more PCR testing, uh, requiring, you know, testing at the border or 48 hours before. But I, I think, Roth, the, the thing is that whether or not and to what, mag to what magnitude that this will cause and affect the whole world remains to be seen. Um, you know, if, if, if we look at it on the optimistic side, um, I, I think this, this whole process will go on for about a month or two right after the new, new year. So by the time of the end of February or early March, it should slow down a bit. So we have sort of a period of time for about a month and a half or two, two months to see whether this will seriously uh, damage uh, the, the, the health on the COVID front uh, in many countries, including Taiwan. We don't know yet, to be honest with you, uh, Ralph. I, I think uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But so far, uh, it, it wasn't that bad uh, from, the, from the virus perspectives because I, I think at the border, uh, we have you know, some tested and then the preliminary results seem to show that it's, it's not the new variants so far. So, so far, so good from that perspective, but we'll see how it goes. But, but, but Ralph, you mentioned the, the diplomatic uh, showdown. I, I think um, uh, the China has made, a, um, I, I think, a bad remark in terms of the reciprocation 
I, I, I think this, is, this has nothing to do with the diplomatic and political um, uh, uh, showdowns. I think it will be more of a, a health concern, both in terms of the health uh, of the Chinese people and the health of various other jurisdictions. This is the year four of COVID. How are we going to tackle, how are we going to work together, I think is of more importance than politics and, and diplomacy. But so we urge China to take it more seriously, to work more closely in WHO and with other countries to show more data, to be more transparent. And that's the, that, that I think that's a healthy way to deal with the COVID as a health problem, the global health problem, and China should be a responsible stakeholder for that. At this point, do you feel that there could be retaliation from China as they talk about racism from the government um, spokesperson and all that? Do you I, feel that that could happen? I, I hope not. I hope not. It, I, I think it, we, we can't wipe out the, the possibilities that there is a, some sort of uh, reciprocations or retaliations from China. But, but I, I think, again, this, and this, is, this is not politics, and this is not even uh, you know, political diplomacy. This is more about the global health. So um, I would urge China to be less politicized and, 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 and more uh, serious about the health of the people, not just the, of, of China, but, but of the people in the world. I think this is a very serious health con concern around the globe right now. So we hope China can do it you know, more responsibly. So a quick follow-up question to you, um, Dr. Tan. You just mentioned the lack of transparency has mm -hmm. been a serious issue. Right. And also, not just people around the world, whether it's experts or scholars from the world, but also people inside China, for example, CCP party members and even academics inside China also express concern over the serious outbreak or the potential serious right. outbreak um, in China, especially the Lunar New Year is around the corner and we can foresee huge movement among the people. Right. So the question is, how will the CCP respond if the situation really gets out of control? And could it try to use nationalism to divert attention? And can Taiwan possibly become the target? Well, uh, I think we've talked a lot about that. Uh, uh, where are the moments where China will externalize the, its internal uh, tension or, or its inter in, internal control problem or out of con problem for out of control? Uh, we, we, we haven't seen that signal at the moment. Uh, it's after the 20th Party Congress, Xi Jinping seems to be under control politically. Now, all of a sudden, there's a white paper revolution. All of a sudden, there's opened up policy to turn 180 degrees. Uh, there might be some, you know, social unrest or some dissatisfaction uh, right around or before or after the, uh, the Lunar New Year uh, holidays, because obviously everybody will predict that, you know, there is an obstacle. Uh, and, and, and the, uh, in the infections, uh, COVID inf infections. But, but, but how serious it, it is, how fast is it, it is, whether or not it will cause further or more social unrest, honestly, we don't know yet, but we don't see a significant uh, signals at this moment to make us believe that it's, it's getting out of control. So, as, so to the point where China has to externalize um, you know, its internal intentions in this region. And even if that is the case, I would say I will put it more in the category of China versus the rest of the world. For example, the U.S.-China relationship or Chinese positioning in the Indo-Pacific as opposed to uh, China's aggression or coercion or in the Taiwan Strait and over Taiwan. Because this is, this is not just a cross-strait issue. This is more about uh, China and the U.S., China and EU, and China uh, versus the rest of the world. So externalization, I would more categorize as you know how China is going to, you know, make a commotion internationally. North Korea, South China Sea, mm -hmm. you know, in outer places, not necessarily towards Taiwan, or not necessarily directly leading towards aggression uh, to Taiwan. Speaking of Chinese aggression, I wanted to bring this back to you, Professor. Um, mm -hmm. This is the second time that China has been trying to rename yes. the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, it started out as the novel coronavirus in mm -hmm. Wuhan, and it pressured the WHO mm -hmm. to rename it to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And now it's trying to talk down the virus to make it sound as if it's um, an infectious virus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you feel is behind this move, this yes. renaming? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we noticed that um, about almost a month ago, China began this campaign to rename uh, the coronavirus uh, pneumonia and uh, tried to label that as a uh, virus infection instead of pneumonia. So uh, I think the, the basic logic behind this, uh, people would say there were basically two competing explanations. But to me, uh, both of them sounds like 
complementary to each other rather than competing. Uh, one is about local governance, because we noticed that just a couple of days ago, especially uh, uh, in early January, uh, the Chinese government decided to uh, open the whole society after the paper unrest. Uh, so this is for local governance. Uh, the second thing is about uh, whitewash, trying to uh, somehow reshape uh, the world's perception of China's national image. So uh, to, to, this, to serve this end, two ends, uh, the Chinese government uh, did very hard uh, trying to uh, achieve this goal of renaming uh, the coronavirus. Uh, why I say these two seemingly competing explanations are actually complementary because they are both important and very uh, beneficial to the CCP's rule in China. It worked very well the first time with them, even the U.S. groups mm -hmm. coming out saying there's some racism in terms of using Wuhan. Yes. With the second term, mm -hmm. still with them, um, the virus at full speed, say in Europe and the mm -hmm. Americas, mm -hmm. do you feel that there will be success in the second renaming? Uh, I, I think uh, domestically, yes, uh, they will be doing this. Uh, but globally, I think for now, uh, as Dr. Tan just mentioned, there remains a lot of uncertainties in the world. So uh, we need to wait and see to see what is going to work out. Uh, but to me, I would say uh, for the WHO, uh, from an international organizational perspective, I think uh, at this stage, maybe it is not the time yet to rename uh, this coronavirus pneumonia. Do you think that China will push harder, will push the WHO to mm -hmm. stand behind them or to support their campaign? Uh, yes, uh, of course. I, I think uh, for the Chinese government, uh, it is their ultimate goal mm -hmm. uh, to selling out that China as a responsible stakeholder to the whole world. Mm -hmm. So uh, to that end, of course, the Chinese government would try their mm -hmm. best to do so. Yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm a little bit um, in doubt of uh, to what degree mm -hmm. they are going to succeed. Can the U.S. push back again, you feel? Uh, probably, mm -hmm. yeah. So Especially, good. yeah, it's all about global health issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Definitely. So we will come back to that later. Mm -hmm. We just spoke about the implications of China's reopening of its borders and record infections as it relaxes COVID, zero COVID and a diplomatic showdown that has followed. Coming up next, we will be hearing from Riley Walters, Deputy Director of the Japan Chair at the Hudson Institute, on the increased role of Japan in East Asian security as Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden meet in Washington, and what this means for Taiwan. Let's now hear from Riley Walters, Deputy Director of the Japan Chair at the Hudson Institute. Riley is an expert on Japan-U.S. relations and is also a non-resident fellow at the Global Taiwan Institute. I spoke to Riley earlier from Washington, D.C. on Japan's increasing role in regional security, including deterrence of a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan, and as Prime Minister Fumio Kishida met with U.S. President Joe Biden in Washington earlier. Let's take a look. There's a lot leading up to this, uh, whether we're talking about Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan back in August, which, which really you know, perked the ears of officials in Washington and Tokyo, or just uh, Tokyo's newest national security strategy, which uh, uh, which labels Taiwan not just as a precious friend, but a very important partner. There's there's a lot of interest in the peace and security uh, around Taiwan right now, both in Washington and Tokyo. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the sort of unprecedented things we saw from Japan's most recent national security strategy was that uh, it, it it notes that you know the peace and stability around Taiwan isn't just a matter for uh, Tokyo, it isn't just a matter for Washington, but it's an international uh, effort. It's an international concern. And so one of the things we've seen from Japanese officials in the past, whether it's at, uh, for example, the G7 summits or the G20 or uh, uh, other international meetings is, to, is the emphasis to include uh, this sentence in these official documents that they are re really concerned about the peace and security uh, around Taiwan. Is this because of China's um, increased aggression towards Taiwan, or is it because of Japan's sense of immediate threat from China and its military buildup in the Pacific? I would say those two are connected. <laughs> uh, there's certainly a concern that China is the, I think the U.S. calls it their pacing threat. Um, it's it's the newest, it's the biggest, it's the, it's the most... Uh, uh, broad. It, it's not just a military threat. It's an economic threat. It's a social uh, threat. You know, there's 
there's all means that the Chinese authorities are using to threaten uh, the democracy of the West or uh, the capitalism of the West. And so uh, there's all sorts of concerns. One of the things that the national security strategy of Japan actually notes is that China is the, they call China the uh, most uh, challenging threat to Japan since the end of World War II, which is pretty extreme language if you think about it. Um, and uh, for the United States, they're also concerned, of course, about the military buildup and, um, you know, these, these events that we've seen over the last year or several years, whether it's military exercises, whether it's the reaction to Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, it's all kind of uh, accumulating. It's, it's growing on top of one another. And so uh, there's real concern in Tokyo that China may continue down this road of belligerence, that it could continue to threaten the security of not just Taiwan, but of Japan as well. What's the concern of Tokyo? Do you feel there will be increased cooperation between Taiwan, the U.S., and Japan in terms of collectively deterring China from doing anything that's drastic in the Taiwan Strait or even to Japan? The uh, efforts by uh, Tokyo right now are really something to admire, I, I think. They are really stepping it up uh, to not just enhance their own defense and deterrence capabilities, but to work with new partners uh, on this, uh, particularly the United States, given that the U.S.-Japan alliance that's been around for decades is really one of the, uh, I think, linchpin of security in the in the Indo-Pacific. And uh, the Japanese, uh, the Kishida administration, actually, to hurt their political rating, actually, has said that they're going to take a more uh, aggressive defense stand, is that they're going to start investing more in counter-strike capabilities. They're going to buy American Tomahawks missiles, uh, to be able to strike uh, those who are attacking Japan and elsewhere. elsewhere, And so uh, this has really actually upset many in Japan. Um, you know, Japan has traditionally been a pacifist country that felt that it, it should denounce war by any means, whether it's uh, even through defense. And so, um, you know, I don't necessarily uh, agree. I think Japan's new efforts are welcome. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to see that there's going to be a lot more bilateral cooperation between the United States and Japan. And then within that, I think there will be talks about how to uh, work with other partners, work with Taiwan, um, work with South Korea and, and others to kind of build, continue to build and invest in these deterrent capabilities. You just heard Riley Walter speak to Rath about how Japan has stepped up on regional defense and how it sees Taiwan as an integral part of its own security. Let's now discuss what this increased cooperation between the three countries could entail. So my question is now directed to Professor. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida met with U.S. President Joe Biden recently, and they issued a joint statement which highlights the importance of maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. So what is the significance of this mention, and can we expect an increased and substantial role from Japan in helping Taiwan defend itself? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think this is a great and very important development in terms of uh, increasing and enhancement for the security in this region, in the Indo-Pacific region. For Taiwan, of course, we welcome this kind of development. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let's take a step back about the role of Japan for the whole uh, up, upcoming year. Uh, this year, Japan is going to, chair, to be the chair of the G7, the Group of Seven. And also, uh, Japan began uh, its tenure as a non-permanent member in the United Nations Security Council beginning January this year uh, for two years. So uh, this is a great uh, moment uh, in terms of expanding Japan's political influence around the world. So I believe uh, the Kishida administration will continue to play a significant role in contributing to regional peace and security. And also, uh, in the meantime, we noticed that uh, because just a couple months ago, uh, Japan revised its own security documents, uh, which highlighted uh, the importance of maintaining peace and stability in this region and also trying to increase uh, its national defense budget uh, for the following five years. Uh, these are uh, very important um, security development uh, in this region because for Japan, it is not only the Taiwan Strait as one of the flashpoints. Mm -hmm. uh, flashpoints also include a possible uh, conflict uh, across the Korean Peninsula, especially from uh, the attack uh, from the, the North 
Korea. And in the meantime, uh, one of the major security concerns around the world nowadays is the ongoing Ukraine, uh, Russian Ukraine war. So uh, for Japan, of course, uh, it will try very hard to increase uh, its influence on those issues. And uh, if we look at uh, the personal level, actually uh, the G7 is going to have their own summit in May uh, in Hiroshima. So that was the city um, bombed by the nuclear bomb, right, uh, toward the end of the Second World War. War. So uh, it is also uh, noteworthy. Japan is going to promote the idea of uh, creating a non-nuclear world. This is, of course, in line with the Biden administration. So for this whole year, uh, we can see more and more uh, proactive role played by the Japan, uh, Japanese government. Mm -hmm. We're well, trying to retaliate, though, yeah. Well, let, let me just add a quick word. I, I, perf I, I agree fully with what with the professor just said. I think it's a strategic uh, discussions between the, uh, the U.S. and Japan. On one hand, I think the United States under the Biden administration wants Japan to do more, mm -hmm. both in North Korea, in mm -hmm. Iran issues, in Ukraine issues, and also in the Taiwan Strait. No doubt about that. Uh, I think well, the Japan is one of the closest al allies with, uh, in, with the United States. But on the other hand, I think Japan is also pushing a little bit harder mm -hmm. to the U.S. administration to make sure that US, the United States is less ambiguous and more affir affirmative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar, right? It relates to the str strategic clarity versus strategic ambiguity. The United States is in a position to, uh, that, that, is, that is in great demand to define and re redefine under what circumstances and what type of measures that the United States will take. Mm -hmm. And this is strategically important both to Taiwan but also to Japan mm -hmm. and to other neighboring countries such as Australia and the Philippines. Japan also wants to know a bit more about the allocation of works you know, you know, under various scenarios. For example, the Philippines, what the, Phil what the role of the Philippines will be playing in, in, in terms of the South China Sea issues in Taiwan Strait, how to collaborate, uh, what, what would the, the, the J J Japanese governments do, and, and what would they, the United States expect Japan to do. So I, I, I think Japan is in a perfectly strategic, strategically uh, uh, best position to be in deep discussions with the United States mm -hmm. on the various uh, scenarios and what concern us is the Taiwan Strait. So what I always mention that, uh, you know, the Taiwan-Japan relationship is not just a bilateral relationship. Uh, uh, Japan is one of our best friends to get us understand better, or get us getting to a deeper understanding discussions or even negotiations with the United States on various issues, including the peace and security issues of the Taiwan Strait. Mm -hmm. Speaking of U.S. allies, and as you mentioned Japan, Dr. Tan, um, we're now moving on to another U.S.-specific ally. The U.S. is preparing to reopen its embassy in the Solomon Islands as it is sending two foreign officers and hiring five local staff after shutting it down in 1993. We have a map of the Solomon Islands here. Its location is strategic, right in between key Indo-Pacific allies of the U.S. from Australia, the Philippines, to Japan. This could also um, complicate and block aid from those allies coming in on Taiwan's east coast to support Taiwan in any contingency. Um, Dr. Tan, I wanted to go back to the Solomon Islands. Yeah. Why do you feel the U.S. is reopening its embassy, and what implications does this have? Is it the rivalry with China, how it signed the strategic agreement with, China, right. with it, and also ditching Taiwan diplomatically. Well, well, you remember that a couple of years ago, uh, under, the, uh, uh, under the Trump administration, um, uh, Solomon Island cut the diplomatic mm -hmm. ties with Taiwan. At that time, uh, the U.S. National Security Council, primarily the Deputy National Security Ad Advisor, Matt Pottinger, was working behind the scene, scene with the National Security Council of Taiwan to try to uphold the diplomatic ties uh, between Solomon Island and Taiwan. Uh, it failed to succeed towards the end, but I, I think uh, Solomon Island at that time, you know, was very clearly leaning towards China, and now just mentioned signed a strategic um, a, a agreement with China. But again, I mean, the United States has to go back to reestablish the relationship with the Solomon Islands, because Solomon Island, as a, as a sovereign state, would also need to strike the balance between the United States and, 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 and China. 
And plus, this is uh, the second island chain. So the island is located in the second island chain. It's strategically, critically important to the security of, of the, both the Indo-Pacific and, and, and the West Pacific. So I, I think uh, it, would, it would serve strategically. Especially with aid from Australia. The best mm -hmm. interest, yes. Exa exactly. I, I think, uh, you know, so Solomon Island, you know, leaning towards China, the in and out of itself has caused serious concern in, in Australia. And so as to push back to the United States. So I think, I think there, it's imperative for the United States to go back to reestablish both the diplomatic ties, but more importantly, you know, the better relationship, uh, you know, with the Solomon Island uh, administration and knowing that Solomon Island, you know, is in denial and, and you know, when asked by the U.S. administration um, uh, of uh, firming up or reestablishing the closer ties uh, with China, including, you know, uh, you know, letting the, this harbors for the Chinese to use. And so, so, uh, so it all tells you that, uh, you know, once U.S., you know, comes back to Solomon Island, I think there is a new strategic balancing that will be established or reestablished in that area, which I think is critically important uh, to the interests of the United States. And so as uh, I think remotely, not directly, but indirectly, but more significantly to the, to the in national interest and peace and security of Taiwan. Um, Professor, do you mm -hmm. feel it's too late for the U.S. to bring that back? Yeah. I, I think it is uh, quite important, and it's uh, sooner, later than never, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, especially but not too late. Not too late. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, especially after the signing of the security agreement uh, between Solomon Islands and China. Uh, at that time, as I remember, uh, some uh, media coverage used the term new sheriff in town to describe China's upcoming role, possible role in the uh, South Pacific region. Uh, but now, we see that the United States is back. So it's a senior sheriff in town again. So I think uh, this can help uh, to boost uh, the confidence uh, in the neighborhood uh, about uh, the U.S. role, positive role, and uh, about the U.S. determination to safeguard democracy uh, in that region. This is quite important. So talking about the importance of strategic location, we talk about Solomon Islands and Japan, and of mm -hmm. course, Philippines is very important. Mm -hmm. And Filipino President Marcos Jr. visited China not long ago, and he met with President Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. And this is Marcos Jr.'s first non-ASEAN visit mm -hmm. ever since he took office. Mm -hmm. So my question for you, Professor, is that are Philippine and China ties warming? And what implications does this have for the U.S. and also for Taiwan? Or this is mere, merely a hedging? Mm -hmm. for Taiwan. Yes, uh, I think uh, because uh, uh, the, the visit, uh, it's a state visit uh, held by Marcus. Uh, he visited China for three days and uh, uh, there were so many business uh, community persons uh, joining his delegation to visit China. Uh, so I would say the main purpose for the Marcus uh, administration is trying to build or, uh, or restore business commu communications with China. So uh, in, uh, on different occasions, actually, Marcus himself uh, assured uh, the Chinese business community, saying that, welcome to invest in the Philippines, and my government will help you uh, to do business uh, with local communities. And so I think the whole thing um, in, the, again, uh, in the background is, it is all about business interest. Because if we take also a step, a step back, uh, in November last year, Actually, U.S. Vice President uh, Kamala Harris visited the Philippines, and he met with uh, she met with Marcus. And Marcus says that I just couldn't imagine uh, there will be a, Philip a future Philippine without the U.S. involvement. Mm -hmm. So this is quite important. Uh, by saying that, uh, Marcus actually uh, uh, reached certain kind of consensus with VP Harris. Mm -hmm. uh, they tried to restore the security ties between the Philippines and the United States. And of course, uh, some people are saying because uh, his predecessor, uh, Duterte, uh, he personally adopted a uh, anti-America sentiment. Mm -hmm. With Obama. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, uh, people were saying, okay, the Philippines right now is uh, le leaning to China, but I don't take it that way. I think right now the Philippines is still trying to employ the hedging strategy. Mm -hmm. Economically, we want to maintain our ties with China. But on security issues, still, the United States uh, is the only uh, 
only a partner that can make us comfortable. But does yeah. this raise concerns in the United States, Dr. Tan? Do you feel this could? N no, no. I, I think I think this is um, the, this is the Philippines hatching strategy that you reestablish where you have a better relationship with the United States on the um, defense base. Um, you know. A, a, enlarging and increasing the military base uh, as an agreement between the United States and the Philippines. Um, I, I think Marcos, President Marcos, has an imperative need um, to, to have a state visit um, to China, and Chinese uh, will have to well receive him in his delegation. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it will change the, uh, the dynamics, but I, I think uh, the hatching strategy is is more difficult to play with these days because China will no longer accept that. Um, you mm -hmm. know, they only want to trade an investment and business relationship, whereas uh, in terms of the defense and security, you know, you go to the United States because that, that's a direct competing interest. So how to synchronize and harmonize mm -hmm. and how to better, um, you know, a position uh, in its hatching way, I, I think it's a it's it's a matter of art. So you expect complications coming. Out I think I think it's more complicated than before. Uh, before that, then people say that in terms of the security and defense, you go to the United States. In terms of the business, China's a huge market. If you if you need energy, you go to Russia. You go to Middle East. It's no longer that simple. We're we're we're, li we're living a more. Um, uh, sophisticated and complicated and, and, and even syndicated world where everything is intertwined and interrelated. So we'll see how it goes. But Philippines is, is a strategic nation and it's even more strategic going forward. So uh, China would have to develop better relationship with the, with the Philippines. But we'll demand Sa more from the Same as the United mm -hmm. States, as strategically both in uh, South China Sea mm -hmm. and also the Taiwan Strait. So we'll, so we'll see how it plays. Definitely, we will go back to that. So we just spoke about the intensifying diplomatic row between the U.S. and China as both compete for allies and influence in the Indo-Pacific. Coming up next, we'll be hearing from Alex Capri, research fellow at the Hinrich Foundation, renowned global supply chain expert on what this competition also means from an economic standpoint. Let's now hear from Alex Capri, research fellow at the Hinrich Foundation, who is also a World Economic Forum agenda contributor Alex is an expert on supply chains, trade, and global governance based in both Singapore and the United States. He spoke to me about how the intensifying strategic rivalry between the U.S. and China is leading to re-globalization of supply chains and decoupling from China. Let's take a look. China and the United States and the West in general are strategic rivals in many ways. Um, what complicates that is three plus decades of enmeshed supply chains, right? That, that, have, um, that have made their way in and out of China through the old process of globalization. Uh, and again, you know, pretty much done uh, and initiated um, by American and European and, and other uh, you know, foreign multinational companies when that model of globalization was still um, feasible. From a supply chain perspective, do you find that China and the U.S. will increasingly compete in 2023? Going forward, there is a strategic rivalry uh, between China, the U.S., and its, and its close partners and allies, and that is going to redefine uh, supply chain. So we will have to see strategic decoupling uh, on one level, on another level, there's going to be continued trade and investment with China in this gray area. Uh, and I say gray area because it, it is a very nebulous gray area that involves um, dual use technologies. Dell Computer has already announced that by 2024, it's not going to have any of its logic or memory chips or any of its chips made in China. So, um, you know, we're hearing the same things about automotive supply chains. Uh, and so um, that clearly is a decoupling trend that's going to continue. That gray zone that I just mentioned is going to be a pretty active um, area with, with two-way trade and investment that's going to continue. 
that's also going to be very tricky uh, because, uh, you know, there are human rights issues. There are potential issues in the South China Sea and, of course, with Taiwan that could literally overnight um, upend that whole gray area. Is this decoupling from China's behavior or do you feel it's a realization of the U.S. and the West's risk management policy? The, qu the question for me is, why did it take so long? Uh, you know, you have uh, a completely different um, economic model, which is a state capitalist model uh, in, in China. It's, a, it's an authoritarian model um, that, uh, you know, that was that benefited from, you know, three plus decades of massive investment in technology transfer from the West. Um, it was easier to look the other way, uh, you know, for for Western companies and Western governments when 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 China's economic heft was much smaller and when its geopolitical footprint was much less. Uh, but as China increasingly became wealthier, as it increasingly became uh, an integral part of you know the global supply chains and the manufacturing base, uh, and the Communist Party. Uh, parlayed that into real politique, um, then all of these systemic differences became very apparent. And, you know, a lot of the nationalistic um, uh, uh, vibe and the nationalistic uh, uh, tendencies that were prevalent and have been prevalent in China for, for, for a long time throughout this period of growth, suddenly people were paying attention to that. So um, as I've said, the relationship with China going forward is evolving and it's going through a major correction. Uh, and again, as I said, the, the, the strategic decoupling will continue. There's no question about it. And, it, and it's, it's quite a risky uh, place to be doing business. Now in the semiconductor industry, um, that rationale got flipped on its head in October of last year uh, when the latest rounds of U.S. export controls targeted much older legacy technologies that nobody thought anybody was going to, you know, mess around with, as as we sort of move along that continuum of export controls and sanctions on people, on software, on technology, um, that's going to further complicate the paradox, the China paradox. Do you feel more of those bans from the U.S. Or to come in 2023? It appears at this point that they're serious about it. Um, although there's, there's been a lack of clarity uh, and obviously there's been pushback uh, from U.S. companies um, and, and of course others. But at the same time, you know, you see that the U.S. has apparently for now convinced the Dutch government uh, to continue to um, to deny export licenses to ASML, to send um, even older legacy, uh, you know, manufacturing equipment for even older legacy technologies, um, that obviously is not a very nice thing for ASML. Um, we've seen the Japanese government also acquiesce to a Washington's demands and agree that they are also going to limit or cut off, uh, you know, specific technology to, to Chinese chip manufacturers and the Chinese chip sector. You just heard Alex Capri talk to Rath about the new supply chains the U.S. is building as it decouples from China and opportunities for Taiwan as it rallies like-minded capitalist democracies in its re-globalization efforts. Let's now discuss how this unabated tech competition between the U.S. and China will pan out. So now my question will be directed to you, Professor. We know that the U.S. has continued to push its companies to reduce its reliance on chips made in China, and even Dell announced that it will stop using the chips made in China by 2024. So we do see, uh, because of the Chips Act, now we do see stricter regulations mm -hmm. and also restrictions on the uh, goods from China. So do you foresee to uh, see that the U.S. continue to push forward more decoupling from China? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we, we can expect that the United States would do more uh, to uh, align with its own political and security alliances uh, to do this decoupling thing with China. Uh, for example, in the past few months, the, uh, the United States 
uh, began to work with Japan, with Netherlands, and uh, along with Taiwan, uh, trying to say that we should stop exporting high-tech uh, manufacturing facilities to, uh, to China. And in the meantime, the United States also proposed to have this Chip 4 alliance uh, between United States, uh, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. So I personally would take these two developments as uh, one of the very obvious indication about U.S. determination in decoupling with China on, on this front. Uh, but in the meantime, we also noticed that China is not sit, sit, sitling, uh, sitting idly by okay. because uh, just in December last year, uh, China actually filed its own complaint at WTO about the U.S. unfair trading practices, mm -hmm. uh, saying that, okay, this kind of uh, uh, trading practice is actually discrimination. Uh, and uh, uh, the Taiwan government actually earlier this month also uh, submitted uh, our own request asking to join their discussion because we all know that under the WTO uh, dispute settlement mechanism, uh, there were basically three different stages. Uh, once you have this kind of uh, trading complaint uh, happened, uh, you need to go through cons bilateral consultation first and then panel review and then appellate body uh, for appealing. Uh, so uh, right now, it is in the very beginning uh, of the whole complaint process uh, argued by the Chinese government. Uh, so Taiwan actually, under the name TPKM, uh, Taiwan, Penghu, uh, Kimen, and Mazu Customs uh, Territory, uh, to say that we should be involved in the process mm -hmm. because we are uh, one of the very important uh, chip manufacturers uh, around the world. So uh, I think this is quite important uh, for Taiwan to demonstrate uh, our willingness to stand by the United States uh, in trying to secure uh, a, a free or democratic uh, chip manufacturing uh, supply chain around the world. Uh, and also in the meantime, it is also in Taiwan's uh, national interests uh, in securing our own uh, technology and also business secrets uh, by doing so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel this is an opportunity for mm -hmm. Taiwan, or do you feel that this is actually um, impeding TSMC's global reach? Uh, I think uh, this is good uh, in, in the way that uh, the United States would actually help Taiwan to coalesce with other countries, mm -hmm. manufacturing high-tech, um, those uh, semiconductors. Uh, but in the meantime, um, it is also very important for, I would say, for uh, the world and also our government to appreciate the role of TSMC. Um, because in the past few months, we uh, saw that the TSMC began uh, to do manufacturing in the United States. So some people in Taiwan were uh, began to worry about the future of Taiwan. So it is quite important uh, to, to receive some reassurances from the United States, uh, from the world, uh, to the Taiwanese people. Uh, once we export this kind of high-tech manufacturing facility factories around the world, uh, we should uh, re, uh, receive certain kind of respect and uh, real national interest. Uh, otherwise, our own people would say, okay, uh, what are you doing? Why are you moving out? This and kind you feel of that importance. the U.S. is reciprocating in that, yes, in that sense? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So I, I think it is quite important. Speaking of the Taiwanese government, there's a global move now to ban TikTok as we've seen in the US, we've seen in India, and how will Taiwan deal with this in terms of national security and balancing with press freedom and the freedom of speech? Dr. Tan, how do you think the Taiwanese government will deal with this and will it follow suit? Well, it's a, it's a very uh, challenging uh, problem to analyze. I, I think um, the, well, any responsible um, government will, will find its it, it, it we'll find this issue in dilemma as to how and whether, how to regulate and whether to, to ban. Let's, in my humble view, let's look at the underlying reason for the policy making. Uh, there are two concerns uh, for um, the apps like TikTok. One is data security, because the data owned by TikTok, the parent company of which is a Chinese company, under the Chinese law, all the data collected by the Chinese companies, if the government, which is the CCP administration, if the government wants that data, the company would have no choice but to surrender and give those data to the government. So that's the security, a data security concern. 
meaning that if the Chinese company collect the data of the users, ultimately it will have a chance to be at the hands of the Chinese government. The second concern is disinformation and the misinformation. Now, that relates to the content. That relates to what's in the TikTok. Now, you have, you, one should have a different perspectives on how to regulate based on the two concerns. I would argue that as for the data security concern, yes, it should be regulated and it should even be banned, but no, on the issue of disinformation or misinformation, you can't simply regulate the content. You can't simply ban the channel because you think the content is out of misinformation or disinformation. And that is against the spirit of a freedom of speech and as a, a country ruled by law. Now, so, so the policy decision, underlying, underlying policy decision need to be thoughtful and very clearly defined as to which is the primary concern that we have. But how uh, much of national security do you feel is a concern? Like well, Taiwan banned a, um, Hick vision in terms of its cameras on the MRT and that. Right. You know, it could be in the same place. Well, that's, that's a different thing. If we, if we, we banned the, 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 the camera, at the CCTV, and, and that, because that's basically, that's everywhere, and that's, that's a tool that used to collect the images. But, 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 but TikTok, uh, yes, there is a data security concern, but, 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 but TikTok is heavily used. And then should we more regulate or should we more look into how to work with the people in Taiwan uh, to have um, you know, a better sense of community and better understanding in defining and redefining or distinct, distinct, distinguishing which are the correct and accurate information and which are the disinformation or misinformation engineered by the Chinese authorities or people around. And I, and I think that should be the right way to do. For the government instrumentalities, the administrations, the public schools, the, the governments, the military, I, I think it's, it's a no-brainer, it's an easy decision just to um, dis disallow uh, the use of TikTok as an app. Just like uh, the federal government or many states in the United States are happy doing that. But the private sectors, I think it's, it's really a hard decision to make. And it has to be a balance. That, that, that's right, and that by balance need to be uh, striking very carefully. And I would urge the administration to, to think hard and think twice on, as to, on the issue of whether to ban tech. So you believe that's why Audrey Tang, the digital minister, has come out and said they're still reviewing and looking at what's best in terms of I, I, I believe so.